guys, so every three months I want to make it a practice to just update us on finances. I've been made aware lately too, contrary to the advice of far too many folks in the church, transparency is so key and so important. So I wanted to be even more forthright about exactly what's happening. Like I'm gonna give you specific numbers today. As you can see, I worked this little chart out before and just wanted to explain it. First of all, just wanted to give an overall view of the past five months of our giving at the Chapel Kenmore. So you know what you're giving towards and you know how much we spend total. I mean, this green line, however, you know, it's not showing up great with the dry erase marker, it indicates what we've received. And you can see this scale here says that we basically operate on about $10,000 a month, right? So like you roll that out over 12 months, it's about $120,000 a week live pretty lean, we're a pretty simple church. Um, we've received this much, right? And you can see over the past five months where that line has been, only in January really, and in May to some extent as well, was the giving, I mean, really in January, the only month that it was over what we spent, and in May it was close to what we spent. And when you can see that we spent this much, so the line of spending went over. Um, in March, I'm actually working something out with that too, about something that got coded in our system to see if that's correct. But you know, obviously you can see we spent more than usual in March, and then we spent about this much more, right? So overall, our spending and our giving in the year 2022 has been a little under par. However, we could say for the past 11 months from July, 2021, up through May of 2022, we have spent specifically $104,774. We've received $103,698, or $103,698. So we've almost just made budget par, like genuinely for the past two years, really since we started meeting outside last year, last summer, I could say that we've been on par. Like we've done pretty well. Like we've managed to just meet our expenses. So did a little more math here just to figure this out. We have about 153 people connected to Chapel Kenmore as of the last statistic we looked at. And we keep like a running list of just saying like, hey, who is connected to us, right? Like who actually like sort of calls this their church home? And we've roughly come up with the number of 153. Now you gotta understand 47 out of those 153 people are on the periphery. So they would almost be considered the people that you can't really predict what their connection is. Like they do show up occasionally. They might come on a Sunday gathering. They might be loosely connected with a DNA discipleship group, stuff like that. But we kind of like don't know whether they're connected or whether they aren't. But we know we've seen them enough. Like we see them come enough that we know that they consider this their church home. They consider it their community for sure. And they haven't made any indication of moving on to anything else or of leaving the church altogether yet. We have uh, 33 kids out of the 153 loosely connected and 51 adults out of the 153 that are loosely connected. Now, this is a little bit of a startling figure and it shows you like it's the reason why you'll hear me often saying things like, come on, man. Come every week, come to Sunday gatherings, be in a DNA discipleship group. Because loosely connected basically means all these people, adults and kids, they don't come regularly on Sundays. Like we don't know when they're gonna show up. They might come every other week, they might come once a month, um, but they definitely don't come weekly, right, to a gathering. And it's not 100% sure that they're part of a DNA discipleship group. Now, I would say some of these folks might be more consistent with their DNA group than they are with Sunday, but either way, they're, they're less consistent coming to a Sunday gathering. So we'd say they're loosely connected just because we're saying, hey, like, it's pretty likely that those folks, like out of all these, like a, a little handful of them serve and help on Sunday and things like that, and not all of them are plugged into discipleship. Now, out of the 153 people that are connected to Chapel Kenmore, we have eight kids that are deeply connected, okay? And we have 14 adults that are deeply connected. Now, what deeply connected means is they come to everything. The only time they don't show up on a Sunday is because they're out of town or they're sick, okay? This is the ideal here, really. I mean, it's definitely how my wife and I, Sarah and I, live our lives. Like, we 
genuinely lived this way in connection to the church since we've been believers. Um, and that's not to toot a horn or anything. We just see that, have the conviction based on scripture that we should be connected to the church in every way we can. And we should also serve outside of the church and build the kingdom. And we have seen that that's how many folks we have. We have like about 22, 23 people that are deeply connected. That means they show up to everything. They are plugged into DNA, discipleship group. They serve somehow. And there's a mixed bag between all these folks too. So you can see like, you see why I bring up the issue of, come on, come be a part. Because <laughs> if we did have 153 people that were deeply connected, because you imagine what would happen. I mean, by that point, we'd be planning another church. Like, we'd be ready to roll. So I'm always calling the loosely connected to get deeply connected. I'm calling the people on the periphery to get loosely connected. And I'm always trying and praying. We are praying and pray with me for more people that are ready to come in and be deeply connected. We want to reach people that are ready to come in and deeply connect and want to join our mission. We want to see that happen so we can continue to reach those people on the periphery and plug people into Jesus that have never heard of him, don't know him, and be on mission. So anyways, when you connect all of this information to the giving information, you see that we received $103,698 ,603 right? in the past 11 months about. If you look at the individuals we have, okay, we have like 106 people that are connected to our church that are either loosely or deeply connected, right? That's 41 kids, 65 adults. So we do have 65 adults that are either loosely or deeply connected to our community. And if you divide 103,698 by 65, you get the figure of $1,595.35 a year per individual that people give. Now, this includes family units, you know, some people in that 65 may not work, some people do, but basically when you look at the percentage, if you imagine, okay, you know, a lot of Jesus followers tithe 10%. I've done that, my wife and I have done that for a time. We've given more when we have more. We've tried to keep it at 10% even when we don't have enough. Like that's just been a general like bar line. That's not a rule. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I mean, when you do the figures here, we basically, average if everybody gave 10% which I'm sure people don't and again I don't know because I don't know who gives what I don't ever want to grade people or play favorites based on that I don't want to court donors that's not cool I love that the chapel like shields me from that information we're always going to find a way to keep it that way even when we get autonomous here in the future God willing um but you know, I don't know who gives what but like according to the statistics like each individual averages uh, like a net income of $15,953.54 a year. Now, we're in a lower middle class, lower class neighborhood. We have some middle class folks too. So, I mean, we factor that in. But I'm pretty sure that there are folks that are loosely connected, that could get more deeply connected, and are, that are deeply connected, that could give probably more or raise their percentage of giving. And that would help us out and that would further our mission. So, Again, what we really want to do is not beef up, you know, facilities or salaries or anything. Our hope at this point is to give the surplus away back into the community and to find a way always to continue living lean. So this is a, that's our financial report. Now, I'm pulling from an article here that's from pushpay.com. It's called 20 Bible Verses About Tithing. It's a great overview of what scripture says about giving, like giving to the church, giving to kingdom things and the history of it. And I'm going to read a bit from that, but I'll put the link in for the article. I'm going to read just straight from the article and you can check out the article yourself if you want to learn more. And of course, you can hit the link at any time and begin giving. You can set up recurring giving through push pay. That's how we do it. We give like a weekly thing. We know a basis of our income that's going to be weekly that we give, Sarah and I do. And you can set that up to be recurring or you can give regularly and set yourself reminders to do so online. You can give through uh, cash or check as well in person through the offering bucket that we pass around. But doing it online is a very convenient way to do it. If you know how to work that, if you need help with it, let us know. Here's what this article says from pushpay.com. It's really comprehensive. It says, what can we learn about tithing in the Bible? Stewardship is one of scripture's key principles. It challenges us to recognize that everything was created by God and is ultimately owned by God. 
humans exist as the managers of these resources. Our finances are one of the key areas where Christians, Jesus followers, practice stewardship. Like our ability to acquire money is given to us by God. And we need to be mindful of how we use these resources to fulfill God's work, to further his kingdom, and to take care of others. Big point is to further the kingdom of God, get the gospel out, build the kingdom, and take care of others. Grow people in discipleship and help people and be on mission and bless people and reach people in need and take care of genuine needs. We don't meet every need as a community either. We try to be smart about it because lots of people ask and want stuff, but we don't say yes to everything. We try to help where it's needed, where it's key, where it's crucial, and then plug people into community so they can experience the life change in Christ and have growth and have character growth that's going to bless their life and make things better. Tithes and offerings have been the chief way financial stewardship has been practiced by God's people throughout Scripture. This is just historically what Scripture talks about. So what is tithing? Like, despite the fact that many people use the word tithe synonymously with any church-related giving, the word tithe literally means tenth. Okay, The tithe was an obligatory offering from the law of Moses that required 10% of an Israelite's first fruits. So the people of God back then gave 10%. This is back when wealth had to do with what you owned, your cattle, like your goods. Because God provided the harvest, this first part was returned to him. It was a reminder to Israel that all things we have are his. It was a show of thankfulness for his provision. It also provided for the Levitical priesthood, festivals, and the needy. Okay, so out of this tithe, like, the priests were taken care of, their salaries were paid for. I work full-time myself. This is how my family's provided for. So I relate to that, right? It also provided for festivals that they threw, like, which again, man, Old Testament Israel was all about throwing big parties and festivals that celebrated what God had done and gave people a time of rest. And then it also cared for the needy, again. And there was a lot in there. Do most Christians, do most Jesus followers tithe? A lot of the confusion around the topic of whether Christians tithe comes from the terminology. Throughout the Old Testament, Israelites were expected to give 10% of their resources to God. That tithe, or tenth part, was a requirement of the law. And that's already a little misleading because when you factor in all their required giving, Israelites actually gave around 23% of their income. Because again, when you factored in giving to the needy, When you factored in like Jubilee, when you factored in, you know, like the times when they would like open up their fields for the needy, things like that. And what they would give additionally, like it ended up being quite a bit. Today, many Christians would say that tithing was part of the law that Christians are no longer required to participate in. And this doesn't mean that they don't believe that generous giving isn't necessary. It means they don't believe that Christians are required, Jesus followers to give a specific percentage. That's true, like there's not a law about that from God. It's not like we're gonna be punished for giving less. In fact, some of these people would say that given the model of the early Christians, Jesus followers, a tithe asks far too little of us. Somebody could say that. Some people have used that to say, you need to give a whole lot to the church, and then next thing you know, uh, the lead pastor has $5,000 sneakers and a helicopter, that's not good. Uh, The conversation gets a little messy when Christians use the word tithing to denote any sort of giving. Christians who have grown accustomed to thinking of all giving as tithing can struggle with this biblical concept. So it's essential we're clear in our terminology. We can give 3%, 5%, or 8% of our income to the church, the church community, but we can't tithe it. To tithe is to give 10%. And the statistics around tithing indicate that fewer than one quarter of any community of believers tithes, any congregation tithes. And on average, Jesus followers, Christians, give around 2.5% of their income to churches. So in that sense, no, most Christians do not tithe. So you can read this whole article if you want to dig into what scripture says, because it does talk about offerings. It talks about tithing before Moses. It talks about what Moses said about tithing. It talks about how Israelites tithe, what the prophets said about it, what Jesus said about tithing and then more noteworthy Bible verses in the New Testament about tithing as well. So study it, look at it, see what scripture says about it, pray about it, and then ask what God would have you give towards our mission. Our mission is to invite everyone into a lifelong relationship with Jesus. You know that we do this through outward focused mission. We're always cultivating and bettering our discipleship process. We're actually looking into making that better right now as well. And we look to do great things in the future to bless people, to help people, to be like a genuine, influence and a force in the community for good where we can really pour 
back into the community and meet even more needs in the future. So pray about it. And God, I do pray that you'd move in our people to give what they're able to give, not to do so out of compulsion, but out of generosity, out of you inspiring it. And God, I pray that you'd help us to grow what we're doing in a healthy way so that we could pour back out into our community and bless people and draw people to you and be a part of wonderful initiatives that bless your name and that bless people and that show people who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening, y'all. Peace.